I think it's very important that when we use terms, we know where they come from and understand why we're using those words and terms because so many people are misled because they don't know what the words mean and the religious leaders are depending on that <clears throat> so that you don't ask them any questions that they can't answer. So they, they will feel you fill with incredible stories, but if you ask them questions and you're really thinking and have done your homework and start studying the subject of theology and where these ideas have come from, you're going to find that the people who are leading the religious movements around the world do not know where these ideas have come from. They're just regurgitating what they were taught, and they have no idea because it's been so camouflaged, so covered up that you would never, ever suspect where the ideas that you believe have come from and what they really represent. I think that this is probably one of the most interesting parts of religion is what do these stories actually represent? Where, where did they come from? And what did they mean in the original story that was borrowed from? <clears throat> and when you start doing that kind of research, checking to see where these ideas were first expressed and what did they mean then and now see how we're looking at them today and accepting them today, you will see we really need to go back and do our homework. So that's uh, that's what I try and do. I try and get people to think about what they say they believe and tell you the truth. And I know that doing that, sometimes you you, you can make an enemy, but like the Apostle Paul said in the scriptures, am I supposed to be your enemy because I tell you the truth? Or have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? And that is, that's exactly what happens. When you tell people things they don't want to hear, you are no longer their friend. They don't want to hear from you again because you are causing them to wake up and they're not interested in waking up. They want to stay where they are and believe what they want, and they'll be happy. And so if you come in, I've used this illustration before. If you were sound asleep, and you're very, very tired, and you're very deeply asleep, and someone comes into your bedroom quietly and slips up close to your bed and turns on a 600-watt bulb next to you, it's going to startle you. And you're obviously going to move your head away from the light and and guard your eyes so the light won't hit your eyes because it's too bright. And that's what happens when you tell people something they don't want to hear. They turn their head. They don't want to hear it. They put their hands up in front of their eyes. They don't want to see it. And why? Because if you're telling them the truth, the truth is, is light Light and truth are the one of the same things in the Bible. <clears throat> so if you're going to tell somebody something, you're going to enlighten them. And most people don't want to be enlightened. They don't care to know. They want to be happy with doing what they're doing. And it's not important to them. It's not really that important. And so they just want to believe what they want to believe. It's not important to know the truth, unless, of course, when you die, if you're going to come before a creator and be judged, well, that's different, but that's your problem. You'll find out when you when you leave this world what's going to happen to you. But I have always wanted to know the truth because the truth will set you free. And believe me, it's an incredible story about when you start looking into where these ideas that are written in, in, uh, in religion spirituality and the Bible and the holy books, where they came from and what they actually mean and how they are still being misunderstood today. For thousands of years, we've been misled in Christianity especially. And Judaism has no, the Judea, Jewish religion today has no idea in this world where the precepts and concepts and belief systems in Judaism actually came from. And I have said before that if you knew where these ideas have come from and what they represented when they first came on the scene thousands of years ago, you would be shocked to know what you are involved in. 
you would be totally shocked to understand what you are involved with. And, and so many of these uh, stories have to do with sex, pornography, violence, bloodshed, murder, incredible dark stuff that's being promoted in religions that we don't even know what the words mean. Mm. And, uh, <clears throat> and I've given you some examples, like the Jews today in Jerusalem, they are praying at the Wailing Wall. And if you watch the Jews who are at the Wailing Wall, watch them on, on the, on the, uh, on the television or on YouTube, <clears throat> watch the Jews at the Wailing Wall. When they're praying, they're bobbing back and forth, bobbing back and forth, back and forth. Why? Because they're having sex with God. That's what it symbolizes. And so, People, most Jews don't know that, and, and the reason why they're at the Wailing Wall is because they don't know that there, there is not the wall of King Solomon's temple. They think it's King Solomon's temple. It's not King Solomon's temple. It is a Roman temple built by the Romans. Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with God or the Old Testament or the Holy of Holies or none of that. King Solomon's temple. King Solomon's Temple, I'm telling you, if you want to know, it can be proven if you just do the research. King Solomon's Temple is the Great Pyramid of Egypt. It's called the Pyramid of the Sun. And Saul, Om, and On, O-N, is the name of the city in, the, in Egypt that the Greeks call Heliopolis, Heliopolis. Heliopolis is Helios, which is a Greek word for the sun, Opolis is a city, so it's called the City of the Sun. The Greeks call that one city Heliopolis, but it was really originally called, if you go to the dictionary, look up the word on, O-N. Hmm. On is the, is the name of the city Heliopolis in the ancient Egyptian. So when you take the three names for the, for the sun god in ancient Middle East, <clears throat> the ancient Egyptian and Middle Eastern area of the world, and you've got King Saul, S-O-L, which is a sun, Saul. Om, in the Hindu, is a god of the sun, the sun god, who gives energy to the earth. And On, O-N, is the city of the sun in Egypt. So it's Saul, Om, On. And therefore, King Solomon, or King Solomon, is the great pyramid of Egypt. Go back and read the Bible, and it will tell you that there is a temple in the midst of the land of Egypt, and, a, and, a, and it's a temple in the midst of the land of Egypt, and the Bible says God put it there. God put this temple in Egypt between north and south of Egypt. And now we find out that the, that the temple, and, and it's an altar at the border and a temple in the middle of Egypt. And so for many years, we were looking at two different ideas, that there would be an altar in the midst of the land of Egypt and a temple at the border. Now we've come to find out that, no, the altar in the middle of the land of Egypt was the, on the Great Pyramid, the Great Pyramid itself sits exactly in the midst of the land of Egypt or in the middle between the upper and lower Egypt. There were two Egypts in the ancient world. Just like there are two Carolinas, North Carolina, South Carolina, there's North Dakota and South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And so there were two countries, two different Egypts. And so where those two Egypts met is at the Giza Plateau. And where you draw the line between the northern Egypt and southern Egypt is directly cut right through the pyramid we call the Great Pyramid. And so the Great Pyramid is Saul Oman's temple. You need to wake up and get out of your misery and start learning where these ideas have come from. Mm 